Good to see you back for what happens to be our 177th uh, Human Humane Architecture show here on ThinkTech Hawaii, which are, is our first show in this um, happy Human Humane new 2021 year. And we're broadcasting live once again from half around the world, meaning from back in Honolulu with Hello You DeSoto. Hello, Martin, and hello, everybody who's watching. Welcome to 2021. Uh, and we're doing this right in the midst of something very auspicious, which we are about to talk about in just a second. But if you look at the pictures to the right of us, you'll see you seeing fireworks in Germany and me seeing fireworks here in Honolulu for welcoming in the new year, hoping that it's going to be a better year than 2020 was. And they were both not supposed to happen because we're both in more or less lockdowns. We actually just entered a, a very tight lockdown again, but and no one was supposed to shoot fireworks, but people did it regardless. You took the picture at the very bottom and uh, Suzanne's son uh, took the one at the very top. Uh, so anyways, and today is actually a national holiday here. It's Epiphany but uh, actually it should be a, a, a holiday uh, over there because something way more, sorry, you Christians, you know, don't get me wrong, but there's something way more um, important happening right now over there in the United States of America. And let's get to the next slide because talking fireworks right now, we're worried about firearms and hopefully not anything coming out of them at the Capitol in Washington, DC to sort of, right? Yeah, and in fact, literally just before we started the show, I was reading out loud what some of the news reports are in which the uh, pro-Trump supporters are actually literally storming and inside and disrupting the electoral vote uh, count that's supposed to be going on right now, claiming that Trump has actually won and Trump has not won, Trump has lost but he has whipped people up to go to his side and disrupt things, claiming that he's still going to be president. And that's what, unfortunately, we're experiencing right this minute on January 6th, 2021. Exactly. So we're not proud of these boys. So, no. you know, behave and be a good loser, you guys. That's right. Try to, try to do better and win again next time. No, but, don't. Uh, Give so up. Let's, let's stay political and go to the next slide because... What does architecture have to do with politics and vice versa? And thanks to my mom, who actually brought to my attention last time we were celebrating my dad's 80th birthday, she was bringing to my attention uh, about uh, Vladimir Putin, who it's probably safe to say, uh, you know, he's not a Democrat and he's not democratic, but the opposite, he's a dictator, uh, one of the too many we have in the world. And we just got rid of one in our country, Donald Trump, so here again is uh, an announcement of him building these monuments, an architect building these monuments for Vladimir Putin. And then there is this interesting uh, news article to the right side, which is basically quoting, uh, which we can call for the best, the chameleon architecture from the past, Philip Johnson, but the worst, an opportunist who was rather scarily close to dictators and sympathetic with, with the Nazis. And that was Philip Johnson. And so in an interview that this architect here, Wolf Prix, who is a founding principal of the architectural firm of Cole Pibelblau, was actually saying it doesn't matter for who I'm building. You know, it's about what I build. Let's go to the next slide, because then in further interviewing him, and here he is at the very bottom right, we have to say the ones my age, uh, at the point where we're in school and postmodernism was over, at least was supposed to be, he came up with this rather refreshing provocative ideas. Here is a sort of, uh, you know, um, uh, yeah, pretty scary and in a good way, um, deconstructive remodeling of, an, um, of, of a rooftop um, apartment in, in Vienna. And here's Wolf Prix now up in age where he's reflecting and basically blaming the younger generation that I'm very close to because I'm mentoring them and I'm honored to do that. And he's blaming them for not having any visions Fairly, he also blames himself and said, we haven't really gotten anything accomplished. And let's look at some of that stuff that he himself thinks he really maybe wasn't doing so well. So next slide. And what are we looking at, DeSoto? Well, you said this is what, this is uh, 
near to or part of the complex that was originally constructed for the Munich uh, Olympics in 1972. And I looked at this building and said, what, what on earth is that? And it's mostly composed of very shiny reflective metal panels. There's one little bit of glass that's visible at the bottom as sort of a triangle. And unlike the original, oh, and also too at the bottom, and this puzzled me when I first saw this, it's kind of a quick sketch on maybe a cocktail napkin of what he was trying to do uh, to have something kind of floating and some, some, I don't really know, you can try to explain that if possible. Yeah. But the original 1972 structure, which is this interesting swoopy uh, thing that's suspended from poles, almost like a giant circus tent would, would have been in the United States, um, is still there and is still interesting and usable. And this new structure, which was built as a, uh, like a convention center or an auditorium or a, 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 like a gathering place, is much more just there to look funny and look interesting and look sort of billowy yeah. and, and not necessarily rigid. And this, buildings like this, as you have said, are the work of star architects who in some cases just simply want to do something that looks quirky and is not necessarily that useful or sensible. Yeah, we can say to that regard, we agree with him that he has failed because he wanted to like be in the tradition of that, you know, greatly right. ingenious engineering marvel of the Olympic uh, tent structure by Frau Adi und Günther Benisch, which looks as fresh these days as, you know, back then, 50 years ago. While his, and it's, it's, it's authentic. It's like what you see is what you get. While here, it's most likely a steel structure, but it's all masqueraded, right? It's covered right. up, it has makeup on. And that, to that degree, is truly formalist and has little to no performative measures. Go to the next slide because, and, and at this point, we wanna let the audience know that as much as possible, we pull from personal, either archives, as in your case, with your great archive, both professional and personal, or us walking around and eyewitnessing things. And I happened to be in Frankfurt uh, around, um, uh, I think it was during my Arizona time. So sometimes in 2013 or 14, where I was seeing this project under construction, which is the European Central Bank Towers, uh, also by Kolb Himmelblau. And Frankfurt has a recent history, you know, a modern marvel, which we talked about before at the very bottom right, which is the Commerce Tower by Lord Norman Foster which is really trying to push uh, that very sort of power and money dominated typology of a high rise into a uh, more ecologically uh, sensitive and re responsible dimension. And that was in the early nineties. And some two decades later, next slide, uh, Wolf Bricks came in and won a competition for this basically fossil monument here, which um, you know tries to, again, as you said, look kooky, look funny, it's twisted and morphed and turned. And at the next slide, but on a performative level, what we see here is the white sheets in the back is actually the construction workers boarding the building up when it was under construction. So it wasn't even totally hermetically completed. And again, I'm not wearing my collar here for decoration because we have snow here pretty heavy these days and it's really cold and this being next door to me uh, in my country, at this time of the year, it might actually make sense because when the sun might come out tomorrow again, this might you know, perform as far as um, a solar gain. But then in the summer, that isn't, I remember Frankfurt is funny because you know the Iron Man being in Hawaii, there's actually a German one in Frankfurt. And some years ago, all the athletes were so happy to perform under cooler temperatures in, in Frankfurt. And we actually had it hotter at that point than in Hawaii. We had a heat wave and it was like in the hundreds. And they're like, yeah. oh my God, we wish, yeah. we wish we would have been still in Hawaii. Yeah. So once again, you know, here, here he is at the beginning or, or fairly into the new uh, 21st century doing basically fossil formalism, which is, exactly. is wrong. So yeah, and, and you, pointed out, you pointed out too that in Germany in a temperate climate where it gets cold for a good portion of the year, it may be useful at times to be sealed into a glass box which will heat up through solar energy. But that's not true 100% of the time. So for the rest of the year where you don't want it to be a heated up glass box like 
a uh, greenhouse to grow plants. And that's something that is uh, very prominent in temperate climates. Glass greenhouses are created to grow tropical plants in cold climates because they gather and conserve heat to keep tropical plants alive when there's snow outside. So Absolutely. sometimes that works, but that's not true 100% of the time for the whole year. Yeah, and for sure not in Hawaii, because this is how the buildings look that we predominantly see popping up in Honolulu left and right, and they're totally wrong. And yes. here they're pretty, pretty wrong too, because the summer is coming next, and then these are wrong too. Speaking of European Union gets us to the next slide, because this is a lady we've been uh, talking about quite a bit. She's now the... Uh, the, the, the head commissioner of the European Union, Ursula von der Leyen here, who's currently struggling with, with COVID as we all are and with uh, getting us as much vaccine as, as possible right now. But she's also uh, promoting something here that you found interesting, right? That we quote at the very top left. Well, she said that she thinks it's time for a new Bauhaus to be created. And I wondered what she meant by that term. Now the Bauhaus, for those who don't know, is was an art school and an art movement and a, and a construction movement, design movement in, created in Germany in the early part of the 20th century, 100 years ago, actually. Yeah. Very forward thinking. And also what, what, you, what I said, what does that mean? You said that you thought that what that meant is a comprehensive, all encompassing type of new attitude in which you design for everybody and you try to affect as much as possible of daily lives to improve them. So I think what she's saying is a new spirit, a new uh, going forward of not only unity, but looking at everything holistically to improve um, everybody's lives. And certainly Absolutely. this would take into account uh, um, climate change, uh, energy usage, et cetera. Absolutely. And, and that being said, you know, the United States continue to be the strongest ally of the European Union. Uh, she's obviously much looking forward to the uh, Camilla and, and, and Joe Biden yes. administration now, because that's the reason why the Proud Boys are so freaked out, because as it looks like the Democrats are about to win, not just the House, because that was in their hands, but also the Senate now. So that gives, again, the Biden-Harris administration much more leverage to be in line with von der Leyen uh, she also calls it the new European Green Deal, and that's obviously referring yeah. to America right. as well. So Correct. it goes both right. ways, right? Right. So right. Uh, next slide is getting us back to America. And again, she, here's uh, Camilla Harris up there. And again, Ursula is a woman. Angela is a, is a woman. Uh, many of the other uh, um, uh, nations who are led by women have actually proven to do better in many ways also during COVID. So hopefully next time, you know, we're long overdue to also have a, a woman uh, leading us. But again, now it's teamwork between, um, you know, Joe and Kamala, that's, that's already as good as we can ask for at this point, right? And again, um, also we wanna say our, our friend Ron Lindgren, who, is, who we're gonna have next with us uh, again on air in the volume two of this show here, reminded us of the tragic fact that uh, of the 350,000 casualties of COVID in the United States, 250, so two thirds are basically uh, the, the wisdom parts of society, the ones 65 and older, and, and that's really tragic. And here, luckily, here are the two presidents that we still have around, Jimmy, the oldest president ever, and, and then Joe you know, running us next. And we're really happy uh, to have them around. And, you know, we see a certain, you know, relationship between the two of them and Joe basically reconnecting to uh, what, what Jimmy did. And let's go to the next slide and talk more about that. Um, and also we want to remember the many that we have lost, again, especially of that wisdom age group. Uh, this is my dear mentor, Bill Bonner, without, you know, whom I wouldn't be where I am. And I probably wouldn't have known about Hawaii. Of course, I knew where Hawaii is, but more vaguely. But when I came back to teach in Nebraska and he took me under his wings, he basically always told me about his dream place, which is Hawaii. And he was vacationing there forever in the past and continued to go there. These were the times when he had his uh, wife, Debbie, and uh, their friend, um, 
uh, Becky out there uh, in Kauai twice. Uh, this was us out there. And next slide. Um, going back to the glorious days of the 70s, uh, Bill was uh, instrumental. He started teaching in 72, and he was the environmental engineer of the building that probably has informed and impacted me the most, which is the 1976 National Bank of Commerce by IMP in Lincoln, Nebraska. And you see at the very bottom right, the achievement of Bill together with IMP, this beautiful fusion of, uh, at that time, grantedly the 70s were still fossil, uh, you know, principally, but this beautiful fusion of all systems, acoustical, air conditioning, lighting, sprinkling, structure, everything collapsed um, into this beautiful blend of reflective ceiling plan. And needless to say, IMP, we have a treasure of IMP, and that's we are referring to with this image from your archives, which shows it before, right before construction, right. and that is East West Center. Right? Correct. That's right. That's right. And go to the next slide. And and this is this is the building here. We see the next generation RMNT Bill um, Met the Bohr up there at the very top left at the east fenestration of the building that is sculptured in a way that it keeps the sun out. So this building basically is between the big awakening of the first oil crisis at the beginning of the 70s and was completed uh, in 1976 and is fully demonstrating that even under not so good political leadership of Nixon at the beginning, you know, architecture was, you know, not you know, giving up and, and trying to do its very best. And then obviously when it was completed and Jimmy picking up from there and really fostering environmental uh, concerns and consciousness, right? So right. this is a brilliant building. And I once gave out the task in talking Chile and my background picture is a, is a picture from the construction originally. And now it's being, you know, below freezing here in Nebraska, even more with a wind chill. I, I can't even tell you, it's like, it feels like 30 <laughs> below. So they were building this through the winter and this is put in place concrete, buff colored concrete. And how in the world did they make this happen to pour through the, the winter and the freezing? Why do we say this and why we don't have that? So we should you know, really be very happy and, and feel honored to be able to, to be able to build under the most right. privileged circumstances right. Correct. constantly perfect you know, temperature, right? Correct, nothing freezes here. Exactly, next slide. Uh, talking uh, marvels from the 70s. Uh, this is a 1975 building uh, by Harry Wees in Chicago. And that caught your interest, right? Yes, and this is interesting because it needed to be placed in a prominent location. So it had to be architecturally rather distinguished looking, particularly considering that it is a high security prison. So the response to that requirement was to build this very sharp edged triangular high rise that is distinctive looking because it's got these very skinny little windows that could only be a maximum of five inches wide. That's for security purposes, but it ended up looking interesting and looking like an old fashioned IBM computer punch card, which the architect acknowledged was part of what he wanted to do. And it became a striking looking building despite or partly because of the nature of what it was doing. It was housing hardened criminals that had to be kept under high security. Yeah, and next, uh, well, stay with this slide for a second here. Just like the Wells Fargo Bank in Lincoln, Nebraska, this was basically pigmented. So the color was basically mixed into the concrete, which I poured in place in a sort of buff color. It was actually imported from Texas. And next slide um, is when I was back in Chicago, um, a while ago, and my buddy from school, Dan Kubrick, basically drove me around and I asked him to drive back because I was hoping that what I saw wasn't real, but it was real. And what is that, DeSoto? Well, unfortunately, they've painted the building this kind of buff mustard color. And for some reason, it's true even here in Honolulu, people feel the need to update concrete, plain concrete, brutalist buildings by painting them this same yellowy color. That's happened here in Honolulu. It happened to the federal uh, building downtown um, with the federal courthouse. It happened to the Kaiser Clinic in central Honolulu. It happened at, the, at UH. 
And for some reason, uniformly, everybody thinks they should do this. They should not. They should leave the building as it was designed, but also because once you paint something, you have to keep painting it. Therefore, exactly. you are putting yourself in a situation of constant maintenance, which the plain concrete did not require. Yeah, yeah. And talking like, you know, finding a societal explanation for that, while in the Jimmy era, it was about authenticity, right? It was about the real, yes. starting with the movie actor Ronnie Reagan and continued to be through Trump even more to an extreme surreal level. It was all about the look and the faking it, right? And trying to look young, even though, you know, you were aging. So right. similar with a the building, they just threw the makeup on the fake over it and we're basically right. covering up its authenticity. And next right. slide. Um, again, I once had the situation, I was also banking in, this is back to Nebraska, and this is the lobby down there. And I happened to be in the, in the lobby and I saw them doing some test paint on some of the counters. And I basically freaked out and a woman that turned out to have something to say basically asked me and When I came back next time, they had scraped off the te pest, test paint and basically um, tried to wash it, get the grease out because it was where the, in the summer when the, the short pants and the skirts, you know, and the, the, the legs were leaving their grease in the, in the concrete. Right. And they were washing this out. And, and luckily, because again, you, you cannot make something like that. This is like, again, me, the Americana. These buildings would have never happened in Germany. We lost the war for good reason. Thank you. And we were traumatized. So modernism was stiff. And this yeah. very proud heroic is was only able to be possible in, in America, only mm. in America. Yeah. And next slide uh, truly shows us Bill, here he is taking the students and me out to where the cutting edge technology is. This is out to the prefab concrete industry in, in, in Omaha and in Lincoln, Nebraska. And you see these huge highway trusses, double T with these amazingly Uh, you know, flimsy and, and thin flanges there. And again, picture up there, we have that too. We have that out there at Great Pacific Rocky Mountain Precast out west at Campbell Industrial Park. And why did Bill show this to us? Next slide, because he wanted to prevent this, right? Because when we're saying, you know, the whole, uh, you know, talking tragic agendas that Trump was still pushing through, his classicism mandate that in the spring you were, You know, hoping this would never happen, but he actually just pushed it through, and we, we'll talk about more about that next week. Uh, but this just didn't start yesterday or with the Trump, so it's preceding Trump. This was at the end of my prairie days, so somewhere be be before 2010. And here you can see this basically, you know, small bank branch uh, being basically a composite structure, uh, the canopy out there is steel being make up and masqueraded with these exquisitely done precast panels that don't try to be, they aren't allowed to be what they are, extremely modern and progressive, but they, they need to become this sort of neoclassical masquerade, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's preposterous. And the close-up photograph of that facade being put over the steel structure is, is mind-bogglingly stupid and phony, totally phony. Yeah. Exactly. And next slide is, you know, when you want the real deal, you go to Europe. And this is when um, I saw Bill last, when he was visiting us in our uh, Radeboil headquarters. You see him with my dad at the very bottom right there. And we took him to all the historic marvels of Dresden here, right? And this is yeah. where the old stuff comes from. And that's where it should belong. And you sure should go there and be fascinated about it. But when you go home, like to America, right. you take it home and you take home from it what you want and then you interpret that. And that reminds us of one person in architectural history who's probably embodying that sort of mentality the most and that gets us to the next slide. And that is who? Well, that's Louis Kahn. And uh, I.M. Pei, who you see at the top, was one of his uh, big fans who was very influenced by him. And you pointed out that here is a documentary about Khan, which was done by his son. You see his son with him in the photograph in the lower left. I have not seen this, pic this, this film. You took your sons to see it when they were very little. And as you pointed out, they saw you crying with emotion to see the work of this man and to find out about his life. Yeah, very much so. 
And again, in, in the movie, Nathaniel, who you see here at the very uh, bottom left with his father and Happy New Year, Nathaniel, we had the chance to get to know him when we brought him to UH to basically show the movie and have a Q&A after that. Uh, never forget that. And basically in the movie, basically he goes out to interview um, for various reasons, he didn't have the chance to get to know his father a lot. So he wanted to get to know him through the ones who have been around him. So he was asking all the famous people who are still around. And one of them was I am pay. And we probably yet have to do a show about him because yeah, we do. footprint in, and he passed away in the very honorable age of 102 last year. And that was some years ago, but he was already up in age. And when Nathaniel basically said, well, I am why? in the world, you have built so many more buildings that my dad has and great buildings, no doubt on that one. Why are you so keen on the projects of my father? And basically I'm pay is very taken. He basically said, it's not about quantity, it's about quality and none of my projects. And talking Washington DC, there's a national gallery right there on the mall, which is an I am pay building. And there it's a beautiful building, right? But he basically said, none of my many buildings get anywhere close to the quality of the work your father has done. So he was an absolutely big fan of him. Go to the next slide. And uh, another one of my dear colleagues, and before that at my student days, Keith Sawyers here, professor in Lincoln here, wrote this book here and talking books, next slide. Uh, the history book uh, he had uh, required us uh, to have in the history class was the one at the very bottom right. And the author was Charles Jenks, who we see up there. And he was a landscape architect by training and also with some practice as we see on the other side. But in the book, he was basically pretty much always bitching about Khan. And I found this sort of weird that I was a student, so I wasn't quite sure why and what. And I hadn't seen any of Khan's work at that point, right? And so I was sort of, and you know, now recently, some years ago when I came back and was, you know, on eye level with Keith, I, I said, why did you um, as, assign that? And he basically said, Martin, I was a victim of circumstances of zeitgeist. We were like postmodernism was at least, you know, over at least theoretically, but still somehow there. So we're like kind of lost and, you know, and that was, that was what it was. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, Jenks passed away as well, I think, uh, last year. So another one we lost. And next slide, talking about losing. And I think we're getting to the end of the show, but let's still try to, you know, at least scratch the surface of what we want to talk about. Because um, here, uh, Jay's uh, repeated guest, Kevin Newt, uh, basically brought this to our attention. And what is that, DeSoto? This is a series of student dormitories at a college in India by Khan using red brick in a very uh, reasonable manner, using brick in a way that it, as he points out, brick wants to be used. This is a classic, this is a complex of buildings. And this uh, college has decided that, or said that they were planning to demolish most of these. And there was an international outcry against that. And people pointed out, now you can't just Throw, throw most of them away and just keep a handful of them as examples, the integrity of the entire project needs to be preserved. And so far they have uh, agreed that yes, that we're not gonna tear these down, which is yeah. a triumph for preservation of this architecture. Yeah, and the next slide is again, is it's just showing we were like outraged and, and this is the project that embodies everything you know, tectonically and, and, and technologically that, that Khan is so famous for. And next slide. This is an exception to the rule. Both, none of us were able to have seen that in real. So we had to pull this from the web here, but it shows how timeless that is and how appropriate it still looks like. And the next slide uh, shows uh, pretty much uh, the plan. And again, the kind of the stupid excuse they had. They were you know, saying there was an earthquake some time ago and there was deterioration. But again, give me a break. If there's a will, there's a way. And as you said, uh, this, this big outcry internationally in the community basically made them change their mind. So another proof of evidence back to politics, we the people right, have the power, we just have to use it. Right. And on a closing note, talking typologically, as you said, these are dorms. And why could dorms to be of, you know, could, should be, you know, in the center of attention for us in Hawaii, DeSoto? Well, because there's a threat to demolish uh, some of the UH dorms. 
And um, that is exactly the same situation. These are outstanding buildings that you pointed out are very useful because you actually lived in one of them when you first moved here. And we need to, again, assert ourselves and say, we need to keep these and don't just destroy them for something which is not gonna be as good. And also is probably just going to look pretty and look interesting rather than be useful and reasonable and appropriate. Exactly. And it's particularly it's Kaikendal Hall that we see up there, which is not a dorm, but a classroom building, but by Takashi Anbi, so a true treasure to keep. So please, our bosses at UH, reconsider that. And as well, again, as you pointed out, you know, I had spent, I was privileged to spend my first week in Hawaii when I came in 2012 in an IMP dorm, which is basically Holland Manoa up there. And it's a beautiful building. So again, go back, reflect that, research that, and then go back to the drawing board. Because again, we don't want to see again what we see at the intersection of University Avenue right. um, and King Street, right? Uh, nor again, what they're proposing for up yes. there on Dole Street where the right. creek comes down, right? These right. are pretty scary, hermetic, invasive creatures. And again, go back to these masterpieces that we have just next door right. because Hala right. Manoa is right there. Right. So with that, uh, once again, uh, happy, humane, new 21. Hopefully, again, everything stays peaceful there up at the National Mall in Washington, DC. And uh, we look forward to have democracy back and we'll reflect more about learning from the past for the future and uh, starting out with volume two of this next time yes. and sharing uh, another Luca building that we actually have witnessed and we want yes. to share how it had some impact on us. Yes. So with that, thank you and uh, see you next week. Aloha.